Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to DNA Behaviors presentation of navigating financial personalities. Uh, we'll, we're working to understand and manage behavioral biases. Uh, my name is Trip Rockwell. I am your uh, chief marketing officer here at DNA Behavior, and I'm working alongside with Leon Morales, our chief relationship officer, who'll be presenting today. Uh, a few notes, uh, house clean keeping here that this session is being recorded uh, and a copy of that recording will be presented to you upon its completion and being readily made available. Uh, we'll also post it to our webinar site where it can be uh, viewed publicly. Uh, a copy of the presentation will be given to you uh, as well. Um, we also have as a handout uh, a, a little more background on financial DNA and you can download that at your leisure. Uh, and then upon conclusion of the webinar, we have a short survey. Appreciate your uh, taking some time and give us a little bit of feedback. It helps us improve our information and how we distribute it. And, and for your efforts, we will provide a copy of our unlocking guide. And it's a good uh, off-cuff uh, resource uh, if you know a little bit about the personality types the people you work with day in and day out and your clients, uh, it gives you some uh, tips on uh, and scripts on how to engage uh, those uh, around you um, based on, you know, based on our principles and philosophies. Uh, so w along with that, uh, we do keep the audio uh, muted uh, so there's no cross chatter. What we would appreciate if you have any questions, please feel free to type them into the chat box. Um, I'm managing that as we move forward so that uh, as questions come up, I'll answer them as best I can. Um, and if they're good to share with the group, uh, we'll do that uh, at the end of our session. Um, and then also that, um, what's the, there's one last thing that we do every time and I'm trying to remember. So, oh, there will be poll questions peppered throughout our discussion today. That helps keep us all on point and that we're all on the same page. Uh, anything we may have missed, we'll, we'll cover again. Um, but so look for those. I'll be hosting those and posting our answers and sharing uh, along the way. And I think that does it. We'll try and keep it below 60 minutes, give you a few minutes back to your day. Um, and that way we can uh, have a Q&A session and, and move from there. So without any further ado, I give you Leon Morales. Thank you, Tripp. Thanks everybody for joining us on uh, this Atlanta rainy day. Uh, we survived Hurricane Irma, uh, or the, you know, moving through the city pretty quickly and doing a little bit of collateral damage with power. Uh, a couple of us were affected by that. But uh, thank you for joining. And as Tripp mentioned, we really try to keep this to uh, about 55 minutes, just to so give you back a few minutes of your day. And um, we're going to really cover the points around behavioral biases and get into a little bit of depth on that, and then how behavioral biases impact in investor decision making. And then really the topic that we've been addressing more often really around advisor, uh, having an advisor equipped with the information to make better uh, sort of helping the client make better decisions around their goals. So we're going to spend a little bit of time on that. And we've uh, done a couple of podcasts recently recently on advisor performance. And uh, in the back of this deck, Trip has the podcast link. And I encourage you to go out and at least listen to one of them. They're typically about 20 minutes. And the feedback we're getting is that they're really clear, concise, pretty short topics, but uh, are very helpful. And they really do relate to the behavioral biases and around uh, what we do here at DNA Behavior. So if you get a chance to, to listen to one of those podcasts, I think you'll find them informative. So <clears throat> one of the things that we do in almost every one of our presentations is talk about behavioral management. And those of you that uh, have been studying behavioral finance probably know this stat. 93.6% of financial planning is behavioral management. And it really does make sense, even for ourselves, that 93.6% applies. Mir Statman did this uh, study back in 2000, but it's still very relevant. And if anybody follows Mir Statman's work, he's done recently launched a new book, and he stays very relevant on the topic. Um, so it's one that we, we, we like to share as part of the work, because we really consider it part of the work that we do. It's not just about investments. 
And here at DNA Behavior, we don't really give investment advice. What we do is a behavioral sort of impact that's going to be, uh, that a person's going to react to based on certain conditions uh, with an investment. But that 93.6%, it really, if you see in the box there, is really around managing emotions, passions, um, optimism, maybe a little bit of overconfidence that comes into that. Um, so your job as an advisor is really to make sure that you're keeping your client sort of uh, doing what they do best, and that's really just understanding the information and making decisions based on that in more of a rational perspective. <clears throat> and what we do here at DNA Behavior with financial DNA, because we'll spend a little bit of time on that, is measuring three things, what we call financial personality, really around the risk profile, which I know almost every firm uh, really does have sort of a risk profile questionnaire. Um, they're constructed differently in some cases. Some of them use a third party application, um, but we use uh, what we call a natural behavior, a financial DNA natural behavior assessment. And we measure not only the risk, uh, the risk profile, but also the behavioral biases, which we'll talk about. And then really around the advisor-client communication, because that's probably one of the very critical things in any relationship, is really understanding people at sort of their, their need for information and how they process information. And then thirdly, around the goals and the spending behavior, because no, what, no matter what, if you have the perfect plan that you've set with your client or the client couple, if somebody's spending behavior is not sort of uh, being uh, sort of managed by them or even sort of however it's decided, it can really derail the plan. So that's why those three pieces to it, which are risk, client, communication, and then the goals are really what make up that financial personality. And we're going to do a little bit of a deeper dive on what that is, but just understanding those three points are going to be very important. <clears throat> and one of the things that we see often in a and a volatile market is that you'll see clients that will react very differently. Some clients react very emotionally, get very upset if the market's changing because it really uh, points to their, their fear that you know they may not make their goal. Others might see it as an opportunity to buy and really see it as building their, their wealth based on buying at a lower price. So both of those clients might be even the same couple and they have very different reactions. So what we do is really try to demystify based on the personality types and being able to give the advisor information that helps them build a suitable plan and then actually work with them uh, throughout the year uh, just to monitor the plan. And we have different tools that help uh, manage that as well. And uh, we'll get into that a little bit later in the deck. <clears throat> and as you know, there's been a lot of discussion around know your client, the fiduciary role. And that uh, keeps, even in our legislative bodies, keeps uh, being brought up. You see a lot of articles on it. Um, you know, there's no doubt in any of our minds here at DNA Behavior that there will be more uh, rigor around the Know Your Client ruling, around the fiduciary role. We see it almost in every other major country that we do business with. And some of them are a little bit more stringent than others. But we see a trend even in the United States with a lot of firms taking on the role of being that fiduciary with the client. Um, and that's what we really see as financial DNA is helping to really understand that more suitable uh, building of the portfolio based on the client needs. And we do that through that natural behavior discovery process. And we do it through um, this 46 question discovery we call natural behavior. It really measures the hardwired behavior of the individual. And with that, you will get that risk profile. You'll see their behavioral biases, such things as loss aversion, pattern biases, overconfidence. And then uh, you'll know what types of communications to be able to use with the client that's going to resonate with them. And then really it's around sort of keeping them in a goals-based plan that's going to match them to, to meet their needs and their, their goals long term. But uh, in the center of that, you'll see that hardwired behavior. We're going to study that a little bit more in a future slide, but it really does meet that fiduciary role. If people use the tools that are provided, even if they don't use a tool like financial DNA, but use much more of a rigor around knowing the client, you're going to have a much better client experience and probably reduce risk at the firm and certainly for the advisor. 
We have our first poll question that will show up here on the screen, and uh, Trip will activate that. All right, just a quick uh, pulse check here. Uh, who here is currently using a behavioral finance tool? And we'll just get a quick cross-section uh, of responses and share those results. So a few of us, uh, which is good, which is great. Uh, a few of us aren't, uh, and, 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 but we, we will caution to say that certainly most folks do have some kind of rule of thumb or off-cuff way of, 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 of segmenting clients in one way or another uh, and making their days uh, easier to uh, engage uh, different personalities, different styles of, of getting things done, but, but certainly our tool is, is more of a set platform that, that provides some of those insights for you. Great, thank you. For the 30% that are using a behavioral finance tool, that's great, um, that's excellent. For the other, uh, if you're not using something, I think probably, even if you're using a risk profile questionnaire or an IPQ investor profile questionnaire, you're probably getting at some sort of understanding of the client, and um, so that's great. Um, I think one of the things that we hear often is behavioral finance over the last five years has really grown in awareness. So it's really helping people understand and it certainly helped us here at DNA Behavior to, um, you know, do these webinars to be able to, to understand um, how to better work with, with your client, couple, or the, the individual or even the family in your firm. So I talked a little bit about the Mir Statman stat of 93.6% of financial planning is behavioral managing. <clears throat> and then Vanguard did a great research paper back in 2015, which is available online, it really around behavioral managing as well, uh, that if you use a behavioral management approach with your clients, you're likely to deliver a, an additional 150 basis points above what they have, could do themselves. And it can really build the firm value because now you're actually working with clients and they're more than likely because they're satisfied, they will provide referrals, which can definitely grow the firm's value, assets under management. But getting back to that client value of 150 basis points, and I'll use sort of a specific example. When someone is uh, potentially overconfident in one of their behavioral biases, they may actually think they can do better than the market potentially. And if you're the advisor, can counsel that individual, and I say counsel, can just give some awareness around some of the things that you know, maybe you've done a little bit of research as part of, uh, of the due diligence with the prospectus. But this client may not be somebody that does research. They may be high level, and they just hear something at a dinner party, but they have this overconfidence bias. And knowing that can really help them um, maybe ratchet down their expectations so they don't get into the investment just based on sort of your, uh, your discussion with them. That's an example of managing those behavioral biases. Um, another example would be somebody that actually has the loss aversion pattern. Um, you know, in the loss aversion pattern, the definition of it is somebody that can gain $10,000 would be happy, but somebody that loses $10,000 would be two times, it would be the loss would be two times greater than the feeling of that law, of that gain. So it's um, pretty impactful, so you really wanna make sure when you see a loss aversion pattern, bias with the client that you were able to manage those expectations. So that's where that 2015 study that Vanguard did is so impactful that you really do add value to the overall portfolio because you're helping the client make better decisions because you're sort of that set, that coaching around sort of, um, you know, that, that they may not be uh, two heads are better than one, really evaluating sort of where they should be. So um, I think that's a real value add to the, the whole wealth advisor process that a lot of advisors are moving into and we certainly support with our certified wealth mentor program not that we're talking about that but it is important to really know that client at a deeper level and getting in a little bit on what we consider what we call natural behavior <clears throat> those of you that study behavioral finance might be aware of daniel kahneman's work around that he won the nobel prize the system one or level one behavior and it's in our assessment we call natural behavior, we measure that, it sometimes is hidden behavior because people don't really talk about it because they don't maybe even realize it is their behavior. 
it's considered blind spots sometimes, but it's those automatic decision-making biases that we have. We don't even know why we do things, we just do it. It also is the learning style, our risk, how we approach risk, um, and then how we actually approach leadership. Um, so those are level one behaviors, we call them. And then level two behaviors are learn behaviors. So level one is sort of wired by the time we're three years old. The research shows that it's very hardwired. Even through coaching, behavioral coaching, you can't change it. What you can do is put awareness so somebody might not make the same decision twice uh, because they do have a, a higher level of, of thinking. And then the level two behavior are things that we learn post, you know, in our uh, in school, in college, in our work experiences, in our life experiences. And the two of them make up our total personality, level one and level two behavior, really makes us who we are. So if you've ever had a client that, you know, reacts to something and you didn't expect it, like in 2008 when we had such a big market shift, we had advisors that would tell us our clients reacted so differently than what we had expected. That was really that natural behavior coming into play, that stress behavior. It can trigger stress behavior. So it's important to know what that level one behavior is as part of your building a suitable portfolio. But I don't want to just diminish the importance of learned behavior because I have a lot of it. Tripp certainly does in his work. But when we're under pressure, we're really trying to move through things pretty fast. We both naturally revert to what we call our level one behavior, and we're both initiators. And we'll get into what that means a little bit later, but I just wanted to show you the importance of these two level one and level two behaviors and how they play out with an individual. And you can definitely help the client in keeping into that portfolio that's going to be suitable to their risk. And then just a, a quick definition of what a behavioral finance bias is. Um, it's really the application of psychology to financial behavior. Um, there's been a lot of research done over the last really 20 years, but uh, you know Daniel Kahneman uh, really in 2002 when he won the Nobel Prize, it became much more of an awareness, and you saw a lot of different uh, programs being developed. And a lot of firms, you know, build their own behavioral finance programs, which were certainly uh, an advocate of anything is better than not doing anything. Uh, but it really does help the advisors be able to work with the clients based on their terms, making better decisions. Um, and if you can actually use a reliable methodology, you can reduce the amount of uh, decisions that are made more impulsively or may not be, you know, that they don't have all of the information that they need to make better decisions. And that's really what you're trying to do. And in this slide, it shows irrational investors who can be triggered by emotion, moving to much more of that improved decision. And that, again, supports that 150 basis points using behavioral coaching as a process. And here, um, when somebody completes those 46 questions we call natural behavior, it will give a, a ranking of the 16 behavioral biases of each individual, and we would all have a behavioral bias chart. You can see here, this is our case study we call Chris Coddington. He is an actual individual in his behavioral biases. And um, we always say if you focus on the ones that are at least 60% or above, that's probably good, starting with his pattern bias, up to optimism bias. He has a very you know, high optimism bias, overconfidence, consolidated view. If you were working with Chris Coddington, who we classify as a strategist, and we'll get into that a little bit uh, in a later slide, but you'd really want to know what his behavioral biases are. It helps you understand the best way to work with him. And if Chris Coddington is married, which in this case he is, we'll walk through a Carol Benjamin slide, who is much more of the, the relational individual in that, in that couple. Her behavioral biases are very different than his. So your role is really learning how to navigate both of them so you build a suitable portfolio for their family. Um, and there's interesting ways that you can do it, but learning these 16 behavioral biases that are stack, stack ranked here are, are pretty important. Um, and if you saw Carol Benjamin's, it'd almost be the reverse of these behavioral biases. And then there's, in the listing here, it always provides what it is and then an action point that the advisor can use to help them mitigate those behavioral biases. 
So now we move into what we call the unique personalities. <clears throat> After someone has completed financial DNA natural behavior, they will be get a end user report, which we always advocate that they get, and it'll give them a, uh, a profile type. And we have 10 of them here. And over here on the left side, there are five of these that are very results focused. And the intensity of results can vary based on sort of the distribution of the bell curve. And we're not going to get into a lot of that because this really isn't uh, intended to be a training session. But it does give you the type of individual, how they sort of process things, how they're wired, more for results. And then the folks over here on the right hand side, starting with the influencer at the top, down to the adapter are more relational profiles. And they tend to sort of wake up in the beginning of the day thinking about how they can influence people and then results come secondary where the folks on the left hand of this, of this wheel think about results first and may think about how it impacts people, but it's around sort of how they, they just are processing things very differently. And then just to orient you a little bit on the behavioral biases here, you can see each one of these corners have the behavioral biases that are most prevalent in this particular um, quadrant. So you see in the engager and community builders that, and relationship builders that you have more of that um, instinctive status quo herd follower bias over here on the initiator strategist uh, influencer. You have more of that consolidated view Optimism, risk-taking, down here on the bottom left, you have more of the savers, the pattern biases, benchmark focus. And then on the bottom right, you have more of the stability types, which would be associated with risk aversion, loss aversion, fear of regret. It's very accurate. It's a great chart. I know there's a lot of information on here, but quite honestly, this serves as the basis of learning behavioral finance for the taking financial DNA. It really helps to orient individuals. And just to, as a note that after someone completes the natural behavior process, 46 questions, no two profiles will ever be the same. So you can think about the universe of, of people teaching this. Um, this is a very simplified way to, to learn it using these 10 profiles. It could be, it's, it's quite interesting as people go through our program, just how easy it is to learn these and then apply them to your client. Uh, client meetings, and we'll, um, you know, there's there's more information definitely that we'll make available, um, lots of resources, but uh, we find this to be one of the most informative ways to 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 learn about how behavioral finance works here with financial DNA. Just gives you a really good one page view, and then we have one more question coming up. Poll question two should show up on the screen. All right, everyone, do you understand how behavioral biases impact uh, both the investor um, and the advisor uh, in their decision making? So we'll uh, let everyone have a couple of seconds to respond and share those results. Yes, we're doing pretty well keeping them on, on point, Leon. Thank you so much. <laughs> Wonderful. And they do, these behavioral biases, uh, they're quite fascinating. I like to study them pretty much every day around how my own behavioral biases come into play, um, which is quite interesting. Um, so here I just wanted to show you one uh, more view of Chris Coddington's behavioral biases, the 16. And you can see here that loss aversion is circled. Um, you can imagine with Chris Coddington, that behavioral biases and that loss aversion category is not something that you need to worry about with him. But when we get down to Carol Benjamin, you'll see that uh, she would have more of that propensity for that loss aversion. And uh, that gets back to that, that loss greater two times in the game. Uh, but these can be a really great way to, to help you manage not only the individuals in your firm, but if you work with a couple or the family, really helping them understand in these investment decisions using these behavioral biases. And then connecting the financial DNA process to these behavioral biases. Uh, this is just a one-page view. After somebody completes financial DNA, we give them this re 
report. We call it a summary report. It's lots of great information on there that helps the client understand that self awareness of them of how they uh, how they think about investing. And you can see here the behavioral biases are actually um, uh, very influenced by these factors we call them. And uh, and if somebody is very take charge, which our friend Chris Coddington is very much of a take charge guy, you have this consolidated view perspective. Um, if he's uh, really reserved, he has much more of that mental accounting perspective. Uh, fast pace means he's really managing sort of uh, the activity. And if he's getting impatient, he might have that over trading propensity. So each one of these has a direct tie to a behavioral bias. Um, so it's important to know these. And again, if you think about the bell curve laid in, uh, layered in here, that this particular profile for Chris Connington has a lot of, of blue here, you can see. So he's very much wired for results. And every person will have a unique profile based on that. But the behavioral biases are tied directly to those factors. And then many advisors use what we call a one-page talent report, which gives them some great information, a snapshot of <clears throat> the client and things that they want to uh, think about when they're meeting with the client. Two that I typically focus on are, you know, how relationship focuses this client going to be. Um, and if the opposite of that would be he may not listen carefully or she may not listen carefully. You can see here you really have to capture Chris Connington's attention because he's probably thinking he's a very fast-paced guy. And also, is he going to relinquish control to the advisor? And you can see here that he's 93% more likely to make his own decisions. Um, and delegating to the advisor is pretty low at 7%. Um, so it's pretty significant to know that. And you might ask your question as the advisor, how would you be able to help support Chris Coddington if he's so decisive and really wants to run his own show? And there is definitely ways to help him keep to his plan. And he looks to have an advisor. Uh, you know, he really knows where his where his his struggles are in this. So it's uh, important that that was part of his self development. And then uh, for the advisor, our recommendation is always to look in the summary report for the environment keys because those can be keys to truly working with this individual. He likes big picture. He's an action plan guy. Keep him informed. Um, keep the points very logical, not too emotional. And he does need time to do his analysis. If you do those five things, you have a great sort of experience with Chris Coddington. If you miss one of these, it can sort of create issues. And um, I think that's one of the points here is that it can really aid in the whole experience with the client. Carol Benjamin. Um, very opposite to our friend Chris Coddington. She is a relationship builder, and I just wanted to point out that she is going to be very relationship driven and will listen carefully. She also is going to be pretty comfortable delegating to the advisor, where you saw Chris Coddington having that very high need to take control. So, somebody like Carol Benjamin is going to have a very different sort of experience with you than, uh, than Chris Coddington. And if they're married, then you would see, you know, your, your real sort of um, goal would be to make sure both of them feel heard in the meeting and that they both feel that, you know, you're building that suitable portfolio based on both of their sort of needs. Because um, somebody like Chris Coddington being so intense on take charge can overpower someone like Carol Benjamin if they're in a relationship. So you just want to make sure that you're checking in with both of them. They feel valued, feel part of that meeting. In the end, you want to build a portfolio that's right for the family. But it does help to be able to work with these, these insights to build a good relationship with the client. So here we have um, the listing of all 16 behavioral biases. You can see here, eight on this side, eight on this side. And uh, the reason that we show this chart, it's one of my favorite charts. It shows that for someone like um, Chris Coddington, who would be over here on the right side, you would see that your role would be to need, need to manage his expectations down because he can have that overconfidence, definitely that consolidated view. 
and you know can risk things that may not need to be taken. The folk, and so this is Chris Coddington over to this side. Carol Benjamin leans over to this side, definitely has that loss aversion, that fear of regret and risk aversion in her profile. And your role would really be to help her um, increase her decision-making confidence. And that's where your role, remember she's somebody that would want to delegate to the advisor. You can really help her make better decisions and she's probably gonna be more likely to listen to you. And you can help her, um, you know, because she's probably gonna be very cautious, you can really help her in better decision-making. So you can see the two types of clients that you can work with, very relational or very results. And, uh, and everybody's gonna have sort of a difference and some of them are a little blended, but it gives you a really good view of how to manage those behavioral biases. And this is another view of Chris Coddington's, it's an extract of his summary report, shows that he's a strategist. So remember the sides, definitely the more results focused profiles, these over here are more relational. Well, he's right there, um, definitely on the results and fast paced side. He's gonna have a very high risk propensity for taking chances, but he also has the risk tolerance sort of within his personality to live with those losses. So you would not have to worry about sort of that loss aversion pattern with, with Chris Coddington. He also scores at group seven, and we use the group one through seven, one being the most conservative, seven being the most aggressive in the distribution of that. Because we do get a lot of questions on you know the groupings and sort of how they fall in. What we find is that most investment committees sort of mirror what we have, it's a European standard. <clears throat> so you can see here, and if you think about the bell curve sort of layered in here, that most of the folks would fall in this more middle range, group three to five, but in the bands that are group one, two, six, or seven, you wanna make sure that you're paying attention to those because those behavioral biases will be more intense in those outer bands. So you just wanna make sure that you understand that and definitely Chris Coddington at group seven is in one of those outer bands. So he would have very different sort of need than Carol Benjamin would because she actually scores, I think, in group three or four. So you really wanna make sure when you're working with the individuals that you know with where they are, this really helps support the know your client and build that suitable portfolio for the client. And the other thing we get a lot of questions on, and certainly in Canada, which has been a really growth market for DNA behavior, is the elements or the key elements of, of risk. And we list these nine points here that really, un, that show how financial DNA meets those requirements. Um, and they're all sort of listed here. And you can see here that it gives you the terminology or the definition. And we, had, we covered level one, and then we talked about level two behavior as well. And each one of these have, has their own sort of process to be able to use, and it, it really supports that know your client, really mitigating the risk of the advisor and the firm. Um, and we usually provide this particular charge to the compliance officer or the, you know, the individual leading compliance at the firm to show how financial DNA supports um, the know your client rule. We have another poll question coming up, poll question three. So if you can. Uh... All right, everybody, based on information we've just covered, uh, if risk propensity is the willingness to take risk, what is risk tolerance? And we'll uh, give everyone a chance to ping in and we'll share those results momentarily. All right, looks like everyone's hitting on the same cylinder, so we'll go ahead and close the polls, share those results, and we're right there. A willingness to live with losses is, is the correct answer, um, realizing that uh, the other options were definitions of some of the other, it's uh, the 16 measurements that we use in defining someone's risk profile. Uh, one that we won an award on, by the way, so it, all, it all goes to uh, help <laughs> Uh, identify where someone's lays in their in their risk profile. Wonderful, thank you, Trip. Um, and I apologize because I didn't really cover that 
in depth on the risk propensity. So that was a trick question today. So everybody did very well. So Keep thank you on you. your feet. <laughs> I try to change it up a little bit because we do carry the topic um, on a monthly basis, but I do find that a lot of people will attend this, so I try to mix it up a little bit. We do concentrate on Chris Coddington's profile and Carol Benjamin as our primary case studies because they are so significant in the behavior. It's just to point out that it's important to know um, you know, when you're working with someone with that sort of intense personality, how to work with them. So great job on the uh, poll questions. So here is Chris Coddington's, um, again, his, his environment keys that we listed. Oops. So um, if you can see here these five that I mentioned, if you're keeping those five key areas, that's great. One of the things that we have as part of the process is what we call the advisor client compatibility matrix. And if you think about the quadrants, if you can reflect back on those 10 profile types that we had, they were, they were sort of sectioned off in quadrants. So I mentioned that, uh, that Tripp and I are both initiators and Chris Coddington is a strategist. So it's one group below or one profile below where, where the initiator is. So that would suggest that he's more fast-paced than, than me or Trip. sort of, uh, you know, if you think directionally where things are. But if we look at the advisor-client compatibility matrix, an initiator with a strategist typically can get along. But when you're looking at the strategist and a relationship builder, that is going to require more energy for that discussion because it's just not somebody that's going to actually connect easily with another person which really gets me to, to sort of talk about couples. And this isn't really designed to be a couples webinar, but we find that 70% of couples are opposites. So you see commonly where a strategist might be married to a relationship builder, community builder, engager. It really sort of supports that whole um, concept of, of, match, uh, of opposites attracting, where it might be sort of mitigating something that you don't have. But it really is um, difficult for some advisors to work with the clients that, that are so different. Um, and then in those 30% they're more alike, that they represent their own set of challenges too because sometimes they're so alike they have a hard time making decisions. But this advisor com client pat compatibility matrix gives you sort of the insights in what, what profiles are going to more work easily together or which ones are going to be a little bit more difficult. And we had a great blog article on our website uh, that, that's there under, if you do a client advisor compatibility matrix, it really shows the importance of how to make sure that you're sort of working with somebody that's sort of in that, in that zone with you. If you're not, just you can do some things to really help enhance that whole communication sort of experience. And that is what that financial DNA summary report does. As I pointed out with Chris Coddington, if you work with him, if you stick to these five points, for anybody that goes through the process, you can usually have a very good meeting, help them really understand themselves better. Um, so it's got a lot of power to it just with that one report called Financial DNA Summary Report. <clears throat> now we're talking a little bit about some of the tools inside of the, the Financial DNA program. And there's one, we have an app called Market Mood. And you can see here it's represented on the screen by this great uh, uh, pie chart here that shows colors. You can see mo the majority of it is green, and then you got some red, and then and then um, yellow. And the keys to it are um, the way that it would sort is if you have you know let's say a hundred clients complete financial DNA, it's going to sort your clients by the ones that have the um, the most need for communication to the ones that see it as an opportunity to buy. So you can see here represented by the green. The ones that are more nervous or fearful, you know, are the ones that will show up at the top. You can sort it any way you want because um, it's all driven by sort of the, um, just clicking on the button to, to generate a different view. But in this case, it's tied to the S&P 500. And you can see here that the S&P is up 2.19%. And we base it on a 15, 15 day trailing average because we don't see that one day makes a market, but over the 15 days is really going to sort of give you some indication of where the market is. But you'd ask yourself, why would 17% of your clients be fearful? And if you think about it, they have this 
notion that what goes up must come down. So they're probably going to need some sort of messaging around that. You know, they're in it for the long term. They're in, a, you know, in the portfolio that's suited for them. Um, it just gives you some good scripts over here that help you work with the client based on their own financial DNA profile. So it's a, it's a great tool. We launched it in 2015. It gets lots of daily use by it. So if you're looking for something, if you had to, not that you would call your client, you know, for every time the market moves, but it does give you, when you do have a point of contact with the client, uh, some suggested scripts to be able to work with. And what it's interesting to note is that I find the more relational clients like to use it for the one clients that they consider to be more results focused, gives them good scripts to be able to work with. On the other side, a very um, sort of results focused advisor working with somebody that has more of that relational profile, it gives them some great tips to think about to work with and reduces the amount of anxiety to make the call. So it's got a lot of purposes to it. I encourage if you haven't seen Market Mood, if you're interested um, with the trial process, which I think a number of people that have been on the call have participated, and if not, uh, there's an opportunity to take it, and we can do a quick demo of Market Mood. We've got another poll question here that should show up on the screen. All right, everyone, can you, as an advisor, use behavioral finance to understand client personalities and help them achieve their goals? And with a few folks chiming in, We'll share those results. Leanne, I think you got them all Wonderful. in line. <laughs> Perfect. Thank, Thank you. you. I hope you're all uh, being honest on that, but I think you probably realize the importance of behavioral finance as it relates to the client. It's, it's a great, uh, you know, the advisors I do work with, when they use an approach, it just helps uh, make their job even more sort of uh, uh, more informative and, and certainly at a higher level be able to work with the clients and, and really help them fulfill their goals. So good job, thank you. So we um, spend a lot of time here at DNA Behavior around the resources and making them available. And we, uh, we usually have three webinars that we uh, host each month. But our real emphasis is around behavioral finance resources. So Tripp and his team do a great job of, of continuing to keep our content fresh. So we usually publish about three blogs a month. We do a newsletter, if anybody's interested in subscribing to that. Um, we really do a lot of work because we feel it's important. Even if you don't use a financial DNA behavior tool, if you're using behavioral finance tool that's suited for your firm, great. I think it's anything that's used is, is, is better. Um, we certainly would love for you to be able to use financial DNA. Um, but uh, I think anything that helps you work with your clients at a deeper level and understand them and serve that fiduciary role, the better. But uh, this year, the majority of 2017 has really been real around that active engagement of the client, providing that fiduciary role, knowing in the United States that it's not a requirement today, but we do think it's moving that direction. And then, uh, you know, with FINRA and DOL that continue to, to look at it, um, being prepared is probably the better answer, and it provides a much more cohesive and, and reduces you know, um, the risk of the firm and the advisor, because there's a lot of scrutiny at the firm level and certainly at the advisor level of, of um, advisor kind of knowledge and, and know your client, so it's better to be prepared. And then we have a little bit of history about our company. Um, we consider ourselves a behavioral fintech platform. We've been around since 2001 and we uh, operate in 123 countries with our assessment process and uh, we use it through a cloud-based process. Um, our methodology of really working with individuals, know, engage, and grow. Know is knowing yourself and then engaging is with your team, and other individuals, and then growing your practice um, because every client and advisor is going to be unique. So using something like financial DNA really helps understand people at a, at a, at a deeper level. And then uh, we measure the 64 factors. Uh, we gave you a slice of that with Chris Coddington and Carol Benjamin, really giving you some understanding and just to reference that, you know, how take charge that Chris Coddington was 
and how fast paced he was. Those are sort of definitions of what a factor is. And then uh, I mentioned one of 123 countries were translated in 11 different languages. And uh, Georgia Tech here in Atlanta helped our research term team with the validation back in 2001. We continue to do a that annual validation every year just to see where we are, how many, you know, how many, what the distribution is uh, of the different profiles. We have uh, over a million profiles in our system, so it's uh, highly validated. And then we have one more poll question. Uh, okay, everyone. Uh, other BFI topics you'd be interested in learning more about. So uh, choose one or choose multiple ones, and that'll help us as we continue to develop our program uh, for your uh, betterment. That's a fairly solid number there. Share those results. Goals-based planning, certified wealth mentoring, and uh, family continuity, which is which is good. We we've got a goals-based planning uh, uh, set up uh, for for next month. Would be uh, would be a perfect opportunity for that. Uh, we just did close out the certified wealth mentor, but that uh, is is a recording that's available. Uh, as are uh, we did a four-part series on family continuity. Uh, we might have to bring that back around at some point. Uh, as it continues to be a popular topic. So thank you for that input, everybody. Great. Thanks, everybody. And um, we take those topics very seriously. If you didn't see a topic that you would like us to cover in the survey that Tripp mentioned, please add that, and we will certainly look at that as a future topic. We try to keep it uh, three to a month, but make it very relevant to behavioral finance and the impact it has in the advisory world. And even any current legislation that's going on, we really try to keep that front and center. And then just to add to that, we've been, Tripp and I have been running a four-part series um, on behaviorally smart team performance. So our next, the fourth webinar will be on September 26th, Tuesday at 1 p.m. I encourage you, if some of you already participated, you will get automatically registered for that next webinar, but if you haven't, please register for this webinar. It's the, the capstone of the four parts, and uh, we will really do a, a, a review and focus on a couple of case studies around these behaviorally smart teams and um, really use some real-life case study information. But uh, it's a, one of my favorite topics to cover, so please, uh, Register for that. And it's just it's good to note that uh, being registered for this webinar uh, gives you access to the other three parts, and they're not necessarily needed in particular order. Uh, can pick up on some of the preliminary pieces. We we do summarize that each time uh, before we dig into the to, to the deeper uh, insights. So uh, you can pick it up as you can, and then review the other ones along the way uh, at your leisure. Thank you. And then just a Q&A, and we have um, my contact information. There's a link right under my uh, email address to take the trial if you're interested. It'll basically just a self-registration link. Take the trial. You'll get your own financial data summary report. And then if you want more information, our website's listed there. And I did mention that we have a great blog site that Tripp and his team continue to keep updated. There's that great podcast series. I think we have about 15 of them out now. So uh, little 19 to 20 minute segments on behavioral finance and teams and you know leadership development, it's great topics. You can find us on LinkedIn at Financial Personality Insights and then we're on Twitter. So we run this series called Behaviorally Smart Money on the podcast series. So look forward to uh, having you join us in one of those and certainly for a future webinar. That survey that Tripp mentioned will get sent shortly after this webinar completes. And then uh, the presentation in a PDF format will be sent out, and you'll get a call recording of this uh, probably later today. And then <clears throat> there is, uh, in the presentation slide deck, um, there is a link there that you can actually take. Try Financial DNA should be the hyperlink is there if you ch choose just to, to take it right from the presentation. And with that, I think uh, we 
have concluded the program for today and we ended it even a few minutes earlier than we normally do because I don't think we have any questions that you haven't answered already. We've uh, we've covered everything fairly well. I think the, uh, the well the one question that uh, of, of, of interest may be uh, how the 10 personality types are distributed in the general population and we do have that readily available and so we'll make sure we add that um, to what we distribute uh, later on today, but it's a great slide. It really shows the, the breakdown, the makeup of the general public, so you can see where yours compares to everyone else around you. Cool. So we'll add that slide into that deck so you can have something to look forward to seeing that we added it. And with that, really appreciate everybody's time today and I look forward to you on a future webinar. Always enjoy talking with you guys, even if you, uh, you know, place a call to us or an email. Um, you know, this is something that's very important to, to me and to TRIP. Both of us support the Financial DNA brand, and we look forward to seeing or hearing you on a future webinar. Thank you, everybody.